Thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. I'm very excited to talk to you about our research. So nature has done a better job of creating nanotechnology than any scientist ever could. And nature is responsible for the plumage on a peacock, which the nanostructure creates the iridescence. Gecko feet work because of nanostructure. You probably have seen the gecko exhibit over there. The reason they can stick to the wall is because of nanotechnology on their toes. And a butterfly or a beetle also has a nano pattern on, it, on their shell or wings, which create their beautiful color. My goal is that if I want to create tools in order to be able to very carefully measure what's going on in a biological environment, I have to create tools that are on the same scale, the same size scale as what's going on in biology. And so I create nano tools in order to put into these environments to do just that. I create nano sensors, which are depicted here. They're about 100 nanometers in diameter. And what they really are is not much different from a plastic ball. So I create little tiny plastic balls. And they are brightly colored. They're squishy. Um, but they measure things. And we put all the chemistry for that measurement with inside the ball itself. And the way that this works, it's a lot like having an oil in water. So we have oil and we have water. And our sensor itself is the oil. All of our chemistries are also oily. And they fit within that ball, like two phases, like oil in water. And I'll talk about it a little bit more. But we can do a lot of tricks with this to measure a whole array of different um, parts of biology. So we can measure things like calcium and glucose, which I'll talk about more today. Each one of our sensors, if you can see there, has a biocompatible coating on the outside so that we can put it inside a structure as small as a single cell and measure what's going on without disrupting that cell at all. So it doesn't even know that that little tool is there. And we can shine a light on the tool, make it fluoresce, and how brightly it fluoresces reports back what's going on in that environment. So the tool that I'm going to talk about today has been developed in order to measure glucose. And we picked glucose for a very specific reason. We picked glucose because of its impact in diabetes. Diabetes has become epidemic in which we know that every day there's over 3,000 new cases of diabetes diagnosed. We know that over 500 people die of diabetes-related complications. We know that over 200 people have uh, diabetes-related amputation. And that over 100 people uh, progress to end-stage renal disease. This is a real problem. And yes, there are tools out there in order to monitor blood sugar levels that can work very well for some people. But I get a lot of, I get a lot of people contact me and say, Yes, it works, but it interferes with my lifestyle, or it interferes with my child's lifestyle. Um, you know, my, my, uh, the, one of the saddest ones I heard was somebody has to get up every hour in order to prick their child's finger to test their glucose levels. Couldn't there be something else? And so it occurred to us that we could apply our nano tools to this environment. And I'll show you how. This is a uh, movie depicting how we envision this tool being used. So, we have an injector that has very small needle array, and it's packed full of nanosensors, nanosensors that can measure glucose in real time. The patient can inject them into the skin, much like a tattoo, where the nanosensors sit in the skin. If we shine a light on the nanosensors, they will fluoresce right through the skin, and our handheld reader, which is actually a smartphone at this point, can tell us how brightly those nanosensors are shining, and thus, how much glucose is in the environment. This is a less invasive way to be able to continuously monitor glucose levels um, in real time. So I'm going to talk to you today about how we are developing this tool. And it has three components. It has the uh, injector, which I will not really talk about today, um, and the tattoo, which is composed of our nanosensors. And I'll discuss that in some detail. And also the reader. If I had given you this presentation two years ago, I would have said it looks a lot like a canteen full of optics. But um, now we have made this as small as a smartphone. And I'll show you that as well. 
So our nanosensors, if you can see them here, our nanosensors have their chemistry within them. So we have a molecule that will recognize glucose. We have a dye molecule that will fluoresce. When there's no glucose in the surrounding environment, those two molecules are bound together. If there's glucose that comes up to the edge of that nanosensor, the molecule that can bind to glucose will unbind from the dye molecule, catch it at the interface, and pull it into the core of the sensor. Once there, that dye molecule is no longer bound to anything, and its fluorescent levels change. Its color changes, too. It changes from yellow to purple. And so this binding process can happen. It can get brighter or weaker as glucose comes in or out of the sensor itself. So we're actually pulling glucose into our sensor. So this will show us how we make it. So I'm going to, first I'm going to ask my assistant, Declan, to come up here. So what, what this works is we have our oil phase, which has all our sensor components, and we have our aqueous phase. Um, and the way that this works is that we don't have anything bound in there. They're only staying in because our sensor components are oily and our water phase is not. And then it's just like making salad dressing. You shake it up, and the oil forms little particles within the aqueous solution. And then we harden them, and they stay that way for weeks and weeks and weeks. Thank you. So we'll show you what it looks like in the lab. So this is one of my students, Katie. She's our hand model for this uh, video. And what she has done is taken this little tiny vial and used a little solvent and dissolved her sensor components in it and all of her polymer and all of her plasticizer, which makes it, it's the component that makes it oily. And what she's going to do is take a little bit of this solution and squirt it into a water solution while she is basically using a tool called a sonicator to bubble that solution very rapidly. So if this plays, you'll see that. So she takes out a little bit of sensor material, and she's going to add it to a little bit more solvent. And then she puts it in to the aqueous solution that's bubbling. And you can see as she adds it, it goes from red in the pipette tip and it will eventually turn blue as the sensors form in solution. Then we filter for size, and we have millions and millions of nano sensors made in solution. And it was that fast. We don't have to do hours worth of science in order to create our nano sensors. It only takes a few minutes. Um, and we've got a batch that we can use for weeks. So I'm going to show you now some pictures of work we do um, in, in mice. Um, so if this bothers anybody, you know, look away for a few minutes. But I will assure you, and you'll see on the next slide, that no animal is harmed during our studies. So what this is showing you is how these nanosensors work in vivo. So we have taken two mice um, there, and we have uh, deprived them of sugar overnight. The next morning, we take a, a fine needle and inject nanosensor tattoos, basically, into the skin. Um, and you can see the five spots in each animal corresponds to you know, hundreds of thousands of nanosensors in each spot. The mouse on the left was then given orally salt water, and the guy on the right was given salt water with a lot of sugar in it. He was the lucky mouse in this experiment. And then we have taken and monitored the fluorescence of the spots in the mouse versus time. And we also take little blood samples and use a handheld glucometer to make sure that our glucose is following what blood, le blood level glucose is. And so you can see here in the graph, the red line corresponds to an, a regular handheld uh, glucose meter. And the blue dots are the fluorescence intensity. And so you can see the fluorescence in intensity starts to go up and follow what the blood glucose levels are as the sugar goes into the mouse's system and starts to be distributed through the body. So we can, we're feeling pretty good about how well we can track uh, sugar levels in mice. OK, and so this picture here was on MSNBC. And after it was on there, my mother called. and. Uh, <laughs> Yes. And she said, Heather, I don't really want to tell you how to do your research. And you know when your mother calls and says, I am not going to tell you what to do, she is about to tell you what to do. And she said, Heather, 
I think you're being mean to the mice. I said, what do you mean I'm being mean to the mice? We're very nice to the mice. The mice, you know, nothing happens to them. She said, I don't think you should hang them by their noses. <laughs> so I put in the next slide for a little perspective. No mouse is being hung by the nose. The picture was taken above the mouse. Um, and what the cones were, were anesthesia, so that they slept through our experiments, so that they held still, because it is very hard to take pictures of mice as they are running around. So I want to assure everybody, no mouse was being hung by the nose. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> um, but the other reason for putting in this slide is to give a little perspective of what the tattoo itself looks like. So you can see yellow spots in the mice. The black spots are actually a marker that we have taken and made dots on so that we knew where we were doing our injections. The yellow spots are hundreds of thousands of nanosensors implanted in the skin. And so if we put them into a human skin, um, it would look like a very small yellow spot um, in the skin. Not a big dragon tattoo or anything like that. They're very small, uh, unobtrusive spots. OK, so I'm not going to really talk about the injector, but I am going to tell you where we put the, the nanosensors in the skin. So this is a picture of what skin looks like if we took a section of it. A regular tattoo is placed here in the dermis. The dermis is a fairly permanent area of the skin. We want to put our nanosensors in the epidermis, which is a layer closer to the surface, which sloughs away after about 7 to 14 days, so that these nanosensors, once in the skin, will read continuously. And then after about 7 to 14 days, the body just sloughs them off with the, red, the, with the dead skin cells, and the user would put a new set of sensors in place. OK, and then finally, I'm going to talk to you about what our optical reader looks like today. It's come a long way from our red canteen um, optical reader that we originally had. So a couple of students of mine were given a small amount of prize money in order to uh, create an optical reader for this application. And um, with this money, uh, the optical reader started out as a red canteen and then got bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and you can imagine, you really want a very small handheld reader in order to go with this system. And we were standing in the hallway, and I said, this, there's got to be something better than this. Everything we need is right in a smartphone. And then my students looked at me, and the idea was born. What they did was they created an app and a case for an iPhone reader. It looks a lot like this. Um, and what it does is uses, I'll show you on the next page, they made a case that snapped onto the back of an iPhone. It has a port above the camera, um, which has a, a ring of lights. The yellow button turns on the ring of lights, which shines through the skin. And then it just uses the camera and the filters that are naturally in place on an iPhone to take a picture of the tattoo, the fluorescence of the tattoo, and then an app which will calculate what the glucose levels are in real time. This instrument here is the big instrument, is the traditional reader we use, the one that takes a picture of the mice from above. Um, and you can see Kate with the iPhone reader and how much smaller it is, more user friendly, and how much closer we are to actually being able to say, we have an app for that. And then finally, before I finish, I really want to thank my students and postdocs because they're the ones that do all the hard work every day to make this uh, a success. And they're the ones that are really inspired in the lab to push this you know, all the way to the clinic. And thank you so much thank for your time. You.